Hello, I'm Tommy Dolores, and I am with the Arthur, a biological stepbrother, Mr. Gregory Bradley. Hello, Miss Tommy. I'm excited to be here and talk about the book. So tell me more about your book. What exactly is a biological stepbrother? Well, the way I'll describe the book is it's an unofficial sibling rivalry laced with unfair parental favoritism. But don't let the title of the book throw you. My brothers and I are biological brothers, same mother and father, raised in the same household. So biological stepbrother is an autobiography, correct? Sure, it is. And it's about your upbringing? Yes, it is. So how do your family feel about you publishing an autobiography? If I just had to guess, you know, I really don't know. You, you'd probably have to ask them, but if I had to guess, probably mortified because I don't think they thought I would do it. Well, first of all, I don't think they thought I could do it. Uh, when my brother put out a book, they thought he was the smartest guy in the world. I remember my dad saying, uh, he got that big time college degree and been all over the world. <laughs> and, uh, and then he puts out a book, you know, 50% false, fabricated, you know, uh, by most witnesses accounts that read the book. But then there's Greg, you know, I, my brother told me, well, if you're gonna lawyer one, you better, law if you're gonna write one, you better lawyer up. Like, I can't talk about my life, but he can talk about his, you know, so, but I don't really know how they would feel about me releasing an autobiography. Uh, you probably have to ask them, but if you did ask them, I don't think you would find any contrition whatsoever on their part, real talk. Growing up, how was your relationship with your siblings? Well, growing up, we were best friends. Uh, my brothers were my best friends growing up. I remember uh, my middle brother and I, I'm the youngest, we're closer in age. I remember us playing Little League football, Little League baseball together, and the Christmases, being excited together, and. We pretty much uh, uh, played sports together all the way through high school. And uh, then my oldest brother, we idolized him. You know, he, he, uh, we mimicked him and wanted to be like him in every way, you know. Uh, he was, you know, all the girls liked him. You know, he was handsome and very popular. At that time, uh, my brothers and I, we were, um, we were close. We were best friends. And then we graduated and got older and we kind of grew apart. Uh, especially my middle brother. He went off to play college football, like I said, and uh, tasted some fame. Uh, came into a little money after that. And uh, if you ask me, it seems like he started to feel like he was better than us. You know, he, I mean, as a matter of fact, uh, he acted like he was ashamed of where he came from. As a matter of fact, he'd tell, he'd tell you that. He would, you know, he'd say, I'm so smart. Let me tell you what he once told me. <clears throat> he said, oh, magnificent minded people don't have any business trying to communicate with normal minded people because they can't fathom your intellect. That's a statement my brother told me. How did that make you feel hearing him say that? Of course it hurt my feelings, you know, that he thought I was, I was dumb and he was so smart. And we're talking about a guy that can't even check his oil now, this coming from a guy that can't even put air in a tire, you know, but he got a college degree and he's played on television and he knows some high profile people. So this coming from a person like that, you know, <laughs> but you know, right now where we at, uh, my relationship with my brothers, I got this thing that I do with my relatives. Uh, I'm a mirror to them. How they treat me, I treat them. So I didn't want to do that with my brothers, but I had to. Um, my oldest brother, you know, he feels more like a brother. But he and I had, uh, you know, we had our thing too, where I felt like he cared more about his friends than he did his brother. Because he would come home to visit, and he would see his friend, and would see his brother. As a matter of fact, his best friend He'd had to drive past my house to go see his best friend all weekend. The next thing I know, I get a phone call. 
he on that slab heading back to Texas. I didn't even see him, but he saw his friends. So, hey, you, what I did, Tommy, is I decided to take the mirror out and treat my brothers like they treat me. So now we don't want to court. That brother did not want to talk to me. I don't want to talk to him. You know, he and my oldest brother, since my, my father passed a couple years ago, we got closer. So we cool now. We're not as cool as I want to be, but we're cool. What's the age difference between you and your siblings? My oldest brother is seven years older than me. My middle brother is a year and some months older than me. So growing up, your parents treated you as an outsider, correct? Exactly. They treated me like, like the best way I can explain it is if a, a mother and father had three children, two of them were biological, they had together. And they went out and adopted that last one. Now that's their child too, but not really. That's how I felt. That's how I feel, till, still to this day. So do your mom know your emotions about how she Sure, of course she does. Uh, they're in denial, like I said, they're in denial. They, they're denying that it ever happened. They're like, uh, well, Greg, if it did happen, can't you just let it go? You know? <laughs> so never an apology. No. Greg, you just want to be right. Who, who doesn't want to be right? Greg, you just want your way. Well, who doesn't want their way? And, and, and why is it so odd when I want it? Why is it so odd when I want to be first sometimes and not always last? Why is it so odd that I just want to be included? You know, but um, you know, that's just where things are. I mean, I've grown to accept it, you know. Um, that's just where things are. What life experience did not make the book that you would like to share to the audience? There are a lot of life experiences that uh, didn't make the book because I didn't feel they was applicable to the story. And there are some life experiences that should have made the book, but I just didn't put them in there because the book would have been too long. But to think of one that should have made the book but didn't. Uh, okay. I remember being on a conference call with my brothers as my dad was going through chemotherapy during the final stages of his life. And we were discussing other possible treatments that we could try with him that could possibly help him live longer. My middle brother had discovered these treatments and he wanted to tell us about them. So my oldest brother and I said, we sat quietly and listened while he spoke. It was pretty lengthy. He spoke about 15 minutes. He's very repetitive, repeating itself. So finally I said, okay, okay, all right, all right. It sounds great. Let's do it. And the phone went dead. I figured, <laughs> These phones, man, they do what they want to do is drop call. I'll just call him back. So I called him back, no answer. I called my oldest brother, no answer. I figured, hmm, that's weird. A few minutes later, my phone rang, and it was my oldest brother. And he said, yeah, man, he hung up on you because you interrupted him. Ain't that a trip? So that's one that didn't make the book, but could have. Okay. Tell me about your religious upbringing. I'm a Christian, raised in a Baptist church. Had to go to church on Sundays and Sunday school. Bible studies on Wednesday. My great grandmother, Miss Maddie Bailey, was the matriarch of the family. Uh, we all kind of uh, followed her way, worshiping God. It was no mistaking about it, you was going to church on Sunday. I got baptized around the age of 10 or 11. Found Christ early in my life. Uh, but in my teenage years, young adult years, I kind of strayed away being out in the world and of the world, giving myself into uh, lasciviousness, which simply means satisfying the lust of the flesh. After 
after some pretty bad decision as an adult, I found my way back to Christ. Found God again, and then I realized I never lost him. And as it was, at, it was at that point that I realized that everything that I know now, all the way back to everything that I knew as a child, was because of my discernment. And all that is, is just the uh, religious ability to just know things. I'll tell you something funny. My mom and dad and some, some relatives would become upset with me because I would start to make predictions or prophesy, if you will. And they would be like, oh, Greg, why you say that? Don't say that. <laughs> you know, and then what I predicted would come to pass. Oh, Greg, it's your fault. You did it. <laughs> no, brother, it didn't happen because I said it. I said it because I knew it was going to happen because God said it was going to happen if you get in your Bible. And, uh, but yeah, I'm... I'm no angel by no stretch of the means, but you know, I'm, I'm very close to my, my Lord and Savior and I begin and end my day in prayer, real talk. And that's great, that's a lot of things that a lot of people fail to keep is God with us at all times. That's right. So you still practice your religion yes. even though it was instilled to you at an early age. Sure, because man, look. Anytime you wake up and realize you're alive in the morning, you're given another opportunity not to just go to work, not to just get up and go about your day and do whatever. We're given another opportunity to lift our eyes and our voices toward heaven and worship and praise God. That's really the only reason we're here, is to worship God. Did prayer get you through a lot of things coming up as a child oh with your yeah parents. oh yeah I listen if it weren't for prayer if it weren't for um, my religious upbringing I've never been a drug dealer I've never I don't drink I don't smoke uh, never been did anything criminal and I've never had a, not one suicidal thought so yeah it was prayer that did that. How long did it take for you to write this book? A little over five months. Um, it went so fast because the story that I told is the life that I've already lived. So it's not like I had to make up something. Uh, it was wrote at work. At the time I worked graveyard. I worked 11 at night to eight in the morning. In the middle of my shift, in the middle of the night, it got slow. I would take out my iPhone and I just started typing down memories of growing up and memories of my life. And in the morning when I got off, I would go home, wouldn't even go to sleep. I just would retype everything into my laptop. And that's pretty much how the, how the book was wrote. And I, and I wrote every day. So the truth is straightforward and quick. So. It's not like I had to make up nothing. The, the, the story that I told in this book is the life that I've already lived. Real talk. At one time, was it like, I need to go ahead and put out a book. I need to go ahead and write a book. When did you come up with that idea? Like, what moment made you realize, I need a book out now? Well, I was hurt. Um... I felt an out, like an outcast. I got tired of being told I was crazy or even evil <laughs> for even realizing that favoritism was involved in my upbringing. I got tired of not having anybody I could go to to adjudicate the situation. Nobody. All I was left with was my soliloquy of thoughts of why. Why am I being treated different than my brothers? So I figure, after my brother wrote a book, you know, and I was shocked at how proud my parents and the rest of the family was. I was shocked knowing that most of his book was fabricated. So I figure, I'll just write a book about the truth because the truth 
is way worse than anything I can make up. Yes. My question is to you, you read your brother's book, or did yes. you go based off what family members were telling you? Well, first of all, I read his book, but first of all, I was a witness. You know what that means? You that, were there. There. The time. And that's a lot of stuff that was in his book it was not accurate. But I challenge anybody. I'm going to tell you the proudest thing. I, I have, I, I'm the proudest about this book. Every single word is true. Most people ain't going to like it. Most of my family members ain't going to like it. I got threatened doing the writing of this book. I even changed the names. See, this book wasn't meant to, do, to defame anyone. So I changed the names so people, they can't claim that I'm trying to de defame them, you know. And that was going to be a question I was going to ask. Did you tweak anything with uh, maybe your mom's name, brother's name? Yes. I, I changed their names. All their na My name is the same. My kids' names is the same. But I, I changed their names because uh, I don't want them to think that I'm trying to defame them or... Just like I told you, my brother said, well, if you're going to write one, you better lawyer up. What? I mean... Where do you do that at? I mean, lawyer for what? I, I, people write um, autobiographies all the time. People write that kind of stuff all the time. You know, my favorite authors, let me tell you something, my favorite authors are, are like Langston Hughes, um, uh, of course, uh, Alex Haley, but my favorite author is Maya Angelou, and this is why. She wrote seven autobiographies several uh, books of poetry, but she was more than that. She was a civil rights activist, a screen play, a screenwriter and playwriter, and, and she was an actress herself. But I read at least three of her autobiographies, and that right there inspired me to go ahead on and write my autobiography. And, and I'm, I'm telling you, every single word is true. I'm most proudest about that. Where can we find your book? You can buy it on Amazon. <laughs> You're really legit. Amazon. Amazon. Uh, and also, too, I'm, I'm getting a website created right now. It's not quite finished, but I'll be letting people know on Facebook and my Twitter account and Instagram when my website is finished. And you can also go there and buy my book. As a father, how do you not practice favoritism? Looking back on how I was raised. Uh, realizing how it feels, uh, realizing how it feels to feel like you're less loved than the next person. Uh, I never want my kids to feel that way. I mean, I mean, I would die if one of my kids came to me and said, seems like you love them more than me. I would die. I mean, my kids know. I, you know what? They probably think a lot of things about me, but I guarantee you what they don't think is I don't love them. They don't think that. Real talk. <laughs> what is their relationship with their uncles? That is a very interesting question. Wow. I'm a biological stepbrother. I hate to do this, I hate to do it like this, but I have to. You know how Prince Charles of Wales, I hate to go this deep. He got those kids. He got William and Harry, right? Yes. They're the prince to the throne once Charles dies. William is the oldest, he's the next in line, right? Mm -hmm. William got married. Had kids. He got kids now. I think his first son is George, and I think he has a daughter now. Now, both of them bumped Harry down. So now Harry is never going to be king because his brother William is the heir. Now he's had kids. Check it. Have you ever noticed? Nobody cares what Harry do. Harry can have 12 children wouldn't even matter. 
I'm Harry. So you say, what kind of relationship do my kids have? They don't have a relationship with them. They don't. Brothers are not supposed to be that way. Brothers are supposed to know things about each other. Brothers are supposed to know each other's kids. Right? Yes. My brothers can't tell you nothing about me. Especially the middle one. And he don't want me to know nothing about him. How we know things about each other is through our mom. Whatever I know about him, I hear from her, ear hustling, <laughs> when she's talking to him on the phone. And she probably tells him stuff about me, but you know, my kids used to ask me, why don't they uncles, like everybody else uncle, have anything to do with them? Now, I have something to do with their kids, all of them. All of them love Uncle Greg, right? But they can't tell you anything about my kids and they don't want to know, real talk. So in parentheses, um, you have go by the nickname, so I don't want to say that. You go by the nickname of Bad Brand. So tell us who's Bad Brand. Like, where did you get the name Oh from? man, you know, I wish I had some shades to put on, talk about Bad Brand, you know, that cat. Um, Tommy, let me tell you this. I once heard someone say, we're all three people. Who people think we are, who we want to be, and who we really are. And Bad Brad derived off that hurt child who got tired of hurting. Bad Brad was that character I had to turn into when I wanted to stand up for myself and say, oh, you know, you're not gonna run over me. You're not gonna do me that way. And I, I remember the thing you said last year and I heard what you told that person. You're not gonna do me that way. Bad Brad was that guy that ushered in this thought. I used to say, if I can't be understood, I won't understand. And what that means is, if you will not understand me, I will not understand you. I don't care how much sense you're making. I'm making sense too, you know. So to sit here and hold a conversation, we gotta make an agreement that we're gonna communicate. I can't just understand, understand you if you don't understand me. So Bad Brad ushered in that thought, if I can't be understood, I won't understand. So I take that same attitude in the studio. I'm a music producer, I make beats. And I made this piece, this piece of music for a friend of mine. And we sitting there, he listened to the music and he goes, Brad, that's bad. And then he writes something. Then he looked at me again. He said, Brad, that's bad. Then he writes something else. Then at one point he stopped and he said, Brad, do you know how bad that is? I said, of course I do. I'm bad Brad. And we kind of looked at each other and that's where that name was born. So I figure, what better name to give my alter ego than bad Brad? Because at, at that point, I wasn't calling my alter ego nothing. He was just a guy I turned into when I wanted to stand up for myself and not let anybody run over me. How many years have you been going by the name of Bad Brad? Ah. Wow, at least 20. At least 20. Uh, uh, my friend that, that uh, was present doing creative inspiration of that name, uh, he's with God now, uh, but uh, it's been at least 20 years since uh, I come up with that name, Bad Brad. Like I say, right now, you're talking to Greg Bradley. You're not talking, because if, if Bad Brad was to materialize right now, man, the whole attitude would change in the room. <laughs> Real talk. For a biological stepbrother, how many chapters is 13. It's 13 chapters in the book. Um, it's very detailed. Um, you know, I tell you, I tell you a funny thing, Tommy. When I got to writing the book, after about three, four chapters in, I said, uh, "I'm gonna go back and proofread over what I'd written." And a, a, a funny thing happened. Strongholds started to break. Forgiveness started to fill my heart. Reading about my own life, reading about, reading my own life, 
became therapeutic for me. So the reason I started writing the book shifted to I was writing the book for another reason, for my own freedom and liberation. So now I'm not resentful toward anyone. Uh, I've forgiven the way I was raised. So, you know, um, it's all good now. I mean, I started out coming from a pain, uh, coming from a place of pain and hurt, and I ended up writing a book from a place of forgiveness and restoration. You know, and everything is cool now. <laughs> what would you tell other brothers and sisters that's out there watching that feels like a biological stepchild? Okay, I'll tell you this. No child forgets how they were raised. No matter how deep the scars, how deep the wounds from coming from a broken home or a, a, uh, ha having a heavy heart, that uh, beauty can rise from those ashes. And you can rise with strength, courage, and your faith in God. In God's eyes, all children and all people are precious. What people have to understand is God can mother you. God can father you. He can be your brother, sister, or best friend. What I had to realize was I'm first, not last. I'm the head, not the tail. I'm the lender, not the borrower. I'm more than a conqueror. That means I'm not only going to win, I'm going to win big. So when your book is out for the public to buy, are you going to send your brothers a copy of your book? That is probably the only way they're going to get a copy because they're not going to go and buy it because they know what's in it. And that's the truth. So how much is this book again? It'll be, I don't know, it'll be around $14.99, something like that. Okay. Something affordable. So my question to you is, after this book, what's this next for you? What do you see yourself as in 10 years from now? In 10 years? Man, that's a really good question. Well, entertainment is my field. I've been a musician since I was 12. Um, I would like to do that. I would like to stay in, uh, in entertainment. Uh, I started playing in a band 16 years old with a friend of mine named Drake. He introduced me to the gigs and the clubs, even though I was too young to be in there. Uh, <laughs> From there, I went to recording uh, with my friend Robert Hughes. Uh, we went to releasing records, putting out records. Um, our big break never came. Um, then there's my cousin, uh, Rick Dorn, who's a praise and worship artist. Man, you gotta hear him. Man, he's awesome, he's cold. He just now came out. You gotta get it, Rick Dorn. And, um, you know, I, I really don't know, 10 years from now, uh, I'm into the writing thing uh, with my friend Marvin O'Brien. We got movie scripts and things like that in the works and on the table. I'm told that this book is also being considered uh, to be turned into a, a, a movie script. Um, I got several interest, interested people in me turning it into a movie script. I'm going to do that, of course. Um, but I don't know, in 10 years, hopefully I'll be still alive, <laughs> and uh, doing uh, what God gave me the talent to do, you know, is play music and be creative. So in 10 years, uh, I hope to be national, nationwide, or worldwide by then. Real talk. <laughs> there you have it. Make sure you purchase Biological Step Brother on Amazon for $14.99.